Me. First, I'd like to introduce our guests who I am thrilled are here to share information with you. I have learned um, I am only an expert in a few things, um, and it is helpful for both me and for you to hear from experts in other fields that are important for starting a business. So we have Cal Rose, who is a, an attorney with Wright Lindsay Jennings, who is going to talk to you about some of the things you need to know about um, uh, legal issues when you're starting a business. And he will give you more information about his background and what he does when he gets into his session. And then we also have Ryan Crawford, who is a VP in commercial lending with Arvest Bank. And so he is going to talk to you about uh, the issues related to um, financing and some of the issues um, related to that when starting a business. So we're super excited that they are here because it's really, those are really big components um, when you're thinking about starting up a business. So I am so thankful that they're joining us because you're going to hear the information from the horse's mouth from both me and from them. Um, and I think that's going to be really valuable to you. Um, so a little bit about um, us and what we do. Sorry about that, check. Um, a little bit about us, what we do. Um, we, we are part of a nation non nationwide network of um, organizations on university campuses like the University of Arkansas. We're funded by the Small Business Administration. We're part of an SBA organization. Um, we are SBD centers across the country. We also are match funded by our um, host institutions like the University of Arkansas. What we do is offer um, training seminars like this one. We've got a variety of subjects. This is one of our key um, seminars where we help people understand a big part of what we do for startup organizations. We've got a marketing boot camp tomorrow for people that really want to learn the ins and outs of marketing in order to do that for their businesses. Um, we've got a financial boot camp coming up. Um, to help people really understand um, the nitty gritty about understanding the financials of their business and get more exposure to financial statements. If you don't have a background in either marketing or financials, um, that's a lot of stuff that you wouldn't really understand. Um, we've got great seminars on human resources and a variety of other topics um, that are really helpful for uh, clients to understand. Um, in addition, as part of our overall consulting services, um, we've got really valuable market research. And again, this is part of our consulting services. We don't really just spit this out. Um, I worked in the corporate world for 10 years um, before moving over to doing this. And I'm starting my eighth year on this. So I've been doing this almost as long as that corporate job. But we use market research to make a lot of valuable decisions. And this information that we have available is on par with that. Um, it's free to you. It does cost us money. And um, it is really valuable. And that was one of the things I was so impressed with when I started working at um, the ASBTDC. Probably the most valuable thing you will see um, or you will find with us is the one-on-one -on -one consulting. I mean, uh, you know, some of the stuff we're going to talk about today is a lot of what we do um, for startups. It's really clear-cut things. Um, but when people set a meeting with me and we get on Zoom or we meet in the office or however we choose to interact. Um, I sit down and ask people about their background, ask them what they're wanting to do, and then we make a decision on how to move forward. So that can be the stuff that we're going to talk about today, or it can be um, smaller scale things to start up a business, or it can be addressing whatever issue you're facing. So our services are broad in scope and our goal is to help you. We're all here with the goal of helping people. We all feel really passionate about what we do. Um, so that is probably the most valuable service that we provide to our clients. So today um, we're gonna talk about um, a few different things. Um, we're gonna talk about whether or not your business idea is feasible. Um, the things that we look at when we make that decision are the market, management, and money. We're also going to talk about writing a business plan, then some other things you need to think about when starting a business. Cal will talk about legal and um, tax issues. And then Ryan is going to talk about financing, and then we'll have some things to wrap up. 
Um, so business idea being feasible. This is really important before you launch into a lot of stuff is looking into feasibility. So we'll talk about the market, management, and money. Um, so one of the most important things is, is there demand for your product or service? I like to use a uh, vitamin business I worked on several years ago um, because it's really a very good example of where we hit all the marks um, to determine whether or not this was a good business idea. Um, so I'll just use that as an example here. And then we've done some other stuff related to businesses I've worked with along, here, uh, along my journey um, in, uh, at the ASBTC. So one of the first things you want to look for is um, how does the industry look in general, overarching industries that may draw, may um, cause demand for your product or service. Um, so in the last probably 10, 12 years, 10, 15 years, we have noticed um, people taking a more proactive approach to their health care. Um, we're more educated. We understand the causes of a heart disease and diabetes and other lifestyle caused um, diseases. People are more and more looking for ways to stay off prescription drugs and live longer um, as we become more educated in ways to do that. As a result, that is driving demand in certain product categories. Um, so we're seeing a rise in fitness activities, whether it be gyms or the pandemic caused people to buy home equipment or work out videos at home, but you know, ways to get active or active wear. And as a result, uh, vitamins, we saw a lot of growth in that category. Um, when we don't know, like I get people coming to me with really niche businesses, we do, or businesses that have, that are in some way very different in their industry, we do a process called customer discovery, and that's primary research where we encourage our clients to go out and ask um, people that they feel are their market for their business and do primary research to find out, okay, is this an attractive business for who I think it might be attractive to? as a way to assess whether or not there's a market. Um, part of our role in, um, in helping people start businesses is to see, okay, is this something that people are looking for? A lot of times when people come to me, they've already done some of this kind of work or they're already doing it and they know that there's a market for their product. Um, but in some cases we need to determine this. You also need to know your competitive uh, uh, forces. So we knew from a lot of research that we had done for this particular supplement, um, we found that um, people that were buying foods that were gluten-free, preservative-free, organic, all natural, that they found those same attributes that they were buying in food to be attractive in supplements. Then we found that at our supplement store, people, or not our drug store, um, people that were buying mascara, shampoo, and other health and beauty related products, they were buying, they were buying those specific vitamins in specialty retailers. So we thought, okay, they're buying those supplements, they're buying products here. Why don't we try to capture that share um, in our store? And none of our traditional direct competitors were offering similar things like that. So we said, okay, here's an opportunity. Um, you also want to look at your market size and market share. We can help a lot with this. We've got reports and research that show total dollar volume in a particular industry in a certain location in Northwest Arkansas. Um, we can look at the volume um, in unit sales or number of people that have purchased in a certain category and a certain geography in Northwest Arkansas. And those are all ways that you can look and determine market size to say, okay, there is enough being sold in this area. We can look at number of competitors, who your competitors are to say, okay, there is a competitive landscape or space for me to enter this market. If there's you know, if we're looking to enter vitamins and there are two stores and they're selling, you know, $6 million worth of vitamins, okay, there might be business, but if it's $100,000 and six stores, well, maybe there's not enough room for you to enter that market. You also need to think about management. Um, before I started this role, I thought about starting my own consulting business and went through this list of things and thought, mm, and saw this opening and thought, I don't want to do all this stuff. I want somebody else in charge of this. I just want to do the consulting and landed on this. Um, but when you're thinking about starting your own business, you need to think about all of these things because they have to either get done by you or you have to hire someone else to do them. So direct marketing and advertising, that includes building a brand strategy building a marketing plan, executing a marketing plan, getting the budget together. A lot of people are not interested at all in marketing. So can you afford when you do, which we'll do about, we'll talk about your financial projections. Can you afford to get that done? Can you bust it and get it done yourself? 
managing finances and controlling cash. Some people see a financial statement or think about keeping up with receipts and entering transactions and keeping up with expenses and cringe. Can you buck up and do that yourself or afford to pay someone to do that? These things have to get done. It's not like you can just throw them by the wayside. In order to successfully run a business, they have to get done. You're also consistently thinking about ways to improve the business. You've got to be kind of a go-getter and have this worrying mind because it has to be done or your competition is going to run up next to you and do it themselves. I like to um, use a kale salad example because I like to make these outrageous kale salads that probably at the grocery store end up costing me $50. Say you're running a restaurant and you've got the only restaurant who's making a kale salad I will eat. And you've got this great regional distributor who's selling you this great kale. So you're making an awesome margin on your kale salad. Well, you're a great boss and you're constantly meeting with all your staff, your waiters, your bus boys, your kitchen manager, your chef. And you meet with um, somebody back at house and find out, well, we're tossing 50% of the kale because it's wilted. That is not the profit margin you think you're getting. So... Um, uh, you realize you may have to pay a little bit more and go for a local supplier. Well, okay, maybe in a marketing um, campaign, you can say, all right, we're shopping local. You may need to play, pay a little bit more, but you're not going to get the waste. These are things you're always going to have to be looking for. Do you have the energy for that? Do you have the, you know, the go-getter to constantly have that worrying mind asking other people working in the business? And then you're going to have to be the HR person, the management, the looking for the right people in the right job. I work on a small team. It's a team effort. We're all doing our part. Um, we're chipping in and helping each other. You've got to build that team and make sure you're putting the right people in the right job. Um, as far as the money, some of the first things I ask people when they come to me, and I'm not getting into people's personal finances. I'm not a financial advisor. My role is the business. But, okay, what's your credit? Do you have cash to put down on this business um, to see, okay, is this even feasible from a startup perspective? And maybe it doesn't mean never, maybe it means not right now, um, but you need to figure out what is it going to cost to start the business? What can you put in yourself? Um, we'll work with some financial tools that we have that are not overwhelming. We do it, step, I do it very step-by-step step with my clients. Um, look at some projections. Um, to determine whether or not this is going to make enough money to pay your bills and put food on your table and help you meet the other financial goals you may have personally. Um, and then you're going to identify funding sources, a lot of which Ryan will talk about. Um, there's some things we don't really deal with, like venture capital, stuff like that. Um, but that is something you've got to think about up front because it may not be never, but might be not right now. And you need to put that on the horizon. Um, also developing a business plan. These are things that I lay out on the table for people. Um, I've learned in almost in seven years of doing this, don't make people do things, leave it up to them. Um, but it is recommended to write a business plan. A lot of times I'll go through exercises with people first before we get to this or offer it up and uh, in, in all of that. Um, I get a lot of people who come to me with business plans they have found online that require a lot more work than is really necessary on the client. And my goal is also to make sure you're not doing and spinning your wheels on a lot of stuff that you don't do. Um, our business plan is really simple. You, we want you to convey all the information and do work that you need to do to have a good roadmap for your business. Um, but I also don't want to see you having to do work that's unnecessary. Our Zoom will include an executive summary, which is a summary of the plan, products and services, the market, the industry, operations and management, and financials. The products and services, you're going to get detailed here. And what is important is that you put this in layman's terms. Pretend that the reader knows nothing about your industry. Um, pretend you're sitting in front of a banker or sitting in front of an investor um, that is the opposite in terms of interests, behaviors financials um, from your industry. I've been doing this for seven years and have come across a ton of businesses that, you know, one, sometimes I'm thinking, I don't even know if they're smart enough to understand this. I have figured it out. Um, but two that are very complicated or it's something I don't know about because I've just never been exposed to it. You need to pretend that your reader, investor, banker doesn't have that knowledge either so that it's easily digestible. And also it's really important that you are very clear cut on what you're planning to do. Sometimes people come 
when they're thinking about a business at a very conceptual level, it needs to get down in a business plan or before you start up at a very, very granular level so that you know exactly what you're going to be doing. And it is not at 100,000 feet when you get down to this point. You also need to lay out your plans for distribution. Is this going to be online? Is this going to be wholesale? Is this direct selling? Are you going to a retailer with a sales guy or a broker? Also need to lay out your, your pricing strategy. This is going to be require some competitive analysis. Are you priced at a premium to your competition? Are you the value leader like Walmart? Are you priced competitively? And then we get a look at structure. Um, if you go to Whole Foods or Ozark Natural Foods, and you pull the almond butter le lever into the little tub, that is bulk pricing. If you go to either of those retailers and you buy it at a jar for probably what is $15 now, it is unit pricing. So those are two different types. If you go to a gym and you buy a membership, that is one form of pricing. If you buy that day, that is um, unit pricing. So those are just some of the different things and you got to lay that out. You'll also look at the market. You've got to identify your target market. Who are the people that you're going to be selling to? We can help you come up with this information through our market research. And then it's going to be kind of on you to know and have an idea for who these people are. You also want to think about a brand strategy. What is going to make you different from your competition? What are the facts that support that? How can you make that claim? Um, you're also going to do a deep dive into your competition. This is not a list. We think about right now, we've got the playoffs. Okay, if anybody's doing fantasy football or really watching, I'm exposed to this on a daily basis. If you're doing the football, you know who's playing what, because who's going to end up, what if what player is injured, all this kind of stuff um, for these upcoming playoffs. Um, you've got to know that level of detail for your competition, because when you get going, you better know who came up with the new kale salad if it's a restaurant. Um, or who's added a new person with a new specialty into a full service ad agency that can now offer another service. You've got to know all the details. Okay, how do they start marketing themselves in another way to reach another target? That can help you understand what's another target audience they're trying to reach. You've got to know all that stuff so you can stay on par, stick to your brand strategy, but understand what your competition is doing. Understand how they're marketing themselves. I mentioned that uh, before. You need to have a clear cut marketing and sales strategy. What are the ways that you're going to market to your clients that meet with your brand, um, reach your target audience, um, and have that set up included in your mark and your business uh, plan? Um, you also need to have a location decision and have that um, supported by our marketing research. All of this will be um, supported by market research. The next piece is industry. We've got some great industry research, but you need to understand what is going on in the industry. What are the common ways that things are marketed? What are the common product offerings? Um, we talked about the vitamin industry. What are the growth drivers there? What are complementary businesses? Um, how are people doing sales and marketing? And the vitamin business is a lot of, um, it's hard to differentiate because vitamin E is vitamin E. Really, the only thing you can do is you know, types of forms. We've got gummies, we've got powders, we've got, you know, all the different things. Um, how are people traditionally, so one of the things people do is price competition. You also need to understand finance and regulation. That is not a regulated industry because there's not a lot of clinical research, but it's heavily scrutinized, um, which has a big effect on how you can market. Um, is regulation pending? We've heard a lot about TikTok and some of the regulation um, affecting um, access uh, to TikTok. I had a client recently asking me about advertising and I brought that up. I was like, I don't know what this outcome is going to be. I don't know what, what this is, but it's something to keep your mind on. And so you may be in an industry like that. Like, okay, what kind of regulation is pending that might affect the industry or the business that you're in? Um, also business challenges. I interviewed with Duracell for a marketing job probably 10 years ago. And I remember thinking, this is a great company. This is a great job. This would be fun. Um, all this stuff. But I remember thinking, okay, these are batteries. Everything hooks up to a charger these days. So what's the plan? And what are these? This has got to be kind of worrisome for the big wigs in this company. Um, and then also, what are the industry trends? What are the niches? Do you have ideas and plans for um, hooking on to those? It's like what we talked about with the vitamins, the food trends. 
um, you know, gluten free, preservative free, you know, this is trickling down already. Not only it's, it's in the mass market, but we found okay, those are also in vitamins. And now we're launching all this stuff in vitamins because we found in research, yep, people care. Operations, so I call this people and processes. In your business plan, you need to have you as the owners, your background, your qualifications, what you're going to do, and then the other people in the organization, that stuff outlined. Um, but what is also very important, not only that it's in the business plan, but you have this laid out for yourself, is the day-to-day -day operations. One, this is going to help trigger a lot of other things in the business plan and in your budget, because you're going to have to think through that day-to-day, -day, what am I going to do? Um, but also, this is going to show anybody that may help you get financing that you have a game plan. Um, you need this so that your employees are informed about what they're going to do every day. I mean, who wants to? I like blank canvas work. Give me a blank canvas any day and then like really, really nitpicky direction. But I still need some guidance on what I'm supposed to do every day. Um, and so this is really important for that, but you need to know when you open your doors that first Monday that you've got a game plan. Now in small business, it's probably going to change day two, but at least you have a game plan, uh, for day one. And that's really important. Um, let's see what else. And then the next piece is the budget. You'll have done a lot of this in the feasibility standpoint to make sure that you can financially do this. This is really important. You're going to include the information, startup, monthly expenses. Um, you're going to do your revenue projections. So you're going to look at profitability. Um, you're going to look at cash flow, which is really important. And this is like your, cat, your checking account. You get your paycheck. You have your expenses. You have what's left over. And then you get another paycheck. Okay. Hopefully there's more at the top of the next month. Okay, so we're going to look at that. That's going to be critically important because what's at the bottom is what you take home to put food on your table or reinvest in the business. Um, so this is really important. And this is what financiers are going to look at to say, okay, you can make your loan payment. The business is going to be profitable. This looks like something we want to do or help you with. The executive summary, you're going to write last. And it is just what it says. It's a summary of the business plan. This may be one to two pages. This is the first thing someone is going to read about the business. And it's going to help them say, yeah, this is something I want to continue reading and understand about. This is something that looks like it's got some viability. So this is a really important part of this business plan. You want to keep it concise. And you want to tease the reader into thinking a little bit more about this. You write it last. I get a lot of business plans that people have worked on before and they write it before as almost like an outline and it serves as a summary that you write at the end. There are some other things you need to think about when you are getting started. Insurance is one. I would say about all the people that you get involved with um, associated with starting and owning a business, including like an insurance agent, get with somebody you trust and know. So start with your insurance agent um, that you have your home, auto, anything other, anything else, um, and ask to talk with their small business, um, you know, side or person. Um, and they're going to help you determine what coverage you need. It's like when you get a homeowner's or auto, you have a conversation, you kind of both come to the conclusion on what your policy needs to look at. Um, insurance, like I said, I've been doing this for seven years and I realized it's not my job to tell you what to do. It's just to give you information and you make decisions. Um, these are some of the, the uh, coverages and policies um, that a lot of people get. It's important that you're protected so that you don't end up in a position where you're selling your house to cover something um, that's happened in your business. So property or casualty co covers um, damage um, that's potentially caused to things that you own. General liability is what it says, general liability. Product liability is in case something that you make injures someone, you're covered for that injury. Workers' compensation is important so that if somebody's injured on the job, you have money to pay them. Business interruption, um, if something causes you to stop um, stop working and um, or stop operations and you leave sales, this can potentially recover, recoup some of that. And then if key person or life insurance um, on someone that's critical to the business so that um, there's some coverage there as well. Personnel, this is really important. Nobody wants um, human resources issues 
on their hands or lawsuits because a person was mishandled in some way or an HR issue was mishandled or not legal. So it's really critical that you know the Arkansas employment laws. Um, understand the differences between an employee and an independent contractor. Employees um, are, you know, W-2, you often pay them benefits. You may, like, uh, whether it's health benefits, retirement benefits, you tell them when to come to work, what to do at work. Um, you give them the tools. Like I have a computer that the University of Arkansas gave me and other things to do my job. Um, independent contractors, you normally don't um, give them benefits. Um, They're on potentially a 1099, which is the self-employment, um, like tax information. Um, they bring their own tools. They often um, set their own hours um, and they typically work maybe for a shorter period of time. And you, they make the decisions on kind of how they do um, their work. It is harder to hire and fire an employee. Um, there's less rules and restrictions with an independent contractor. So the relationship between an independent contractor and an employee is just different and a little bit less commitment with a contractor. Um, and you can find out more about it with the Arkansas Department of Labor. Um, also know the practices for interviewing, hiring, and firing. Um, there's just a lot of stuff related to this that you want to make sure you get right so that there's not um, issues with equal opportunity, discrimination, anything like this. Um, because you can get yourself in a lot of trouble and you want to be viewed as an employer of choice. You want people to want to work for you. Um, so that's really important too. Uh, personnel manual or employee handbooks are really good. This can help you if you get yourself into a position um, where you need to let someone go because you've got clear cut rules. They were not following um, the things that are permitted or not permitted. You've got some documentation and some things laid out so that it's a lot less gray area. And again, you want to be an employer of choice. People that are happy work harder. Um, so when you've got some guidelines for people um, that are easy to follow, people are more clear and just, you know, they're not confused. They're not running around with anxiety. Um, also consider employment or temp agencies. This helps, can help you with some of these legal issues and things that maybe you're less familiar with. There are also a lot of human resources consultants out there that you can get some help with on some of these steps. Um, that you can you know, keep on retainer or talk with once in a while. We've got some internal resources. We do not give legal advice on anything, um, but we do have some human resources um, people in our network that answer questions. Um, so that can be beneficial, but I would encourage you um, to take this fee seriously as well. Home-based businesses. There are tax advantages to home-based. You need to make sure you can work out of your home. Those are planning commission questions. Um, and there are tax advantages for using your home. You can write off some of the expenses of home ownership. Um, you're going to need different types of insurance coverage, so you want to make sure you cover that. And then there's some little details. Home address on, um, on communication. Do you use your home telephone? Some people do. Some people don't think through all that stuff. Marketing. You have to invest in your business to grow it. You want to really think through a brand strategy. Um, this is the foundation. This is really where you identify your target market and how you're going to be different, how you're going to communicate that out. Um, you do need to have a solid marketing plan. Don't have a shotgun approach where you're just throwing stuff out there. It's a, it causes you to waste money and time. You do need a website. You know, if I look up a business and it's just a Facebook page, a lot of time it loses legitimacy for me and I move on to the next thing. Social media platforms, don't do the shotgun approach. Pick the ones that are most applicable to um, to your audience, you know, Facebook may be older, Instagram, TikTok, those may be for younger consumers. Um, let's think about the type of business and which social media platform is appropriate for it, um, and then make your decisions. Networking, uh, especially for service businesses, don't uh, don't underestimate the power of get, getting out and meeting people. I serve on a small business council uh, for the Rogers. Uh, Lowell Chamber of Commerce, I get out there, never fails that I meet someone that I end up meeting with. Um, and if you're extroverted, it's fun. There's a ton of different um, opportunities to get involved with networking events. So there's going to be something out there for you. Um, and it is not a dead form of marketing. So I'll turn it over to Cal.
um, who's going to talk to you about some of the legal issues. Thanks, Lori. Uh, Lori, can you confirm you can hear me okay? I can. Perfect. All right. Well, thanks, everybody, for joining us today. As, as Lori mentioned, uh, my name is Cal Rose. I'm an attorney at Wright, Lindsay & Jennings here in Rogers. Uh, we also have an office in Little Rock. Um, we've got about 75 plus attorneys. So um, we've got somebody here that does a little bit of everything. My focus is working with um, businesses, small business owners, entrepreneurs on you know everything from starting a business uh, to selling a business and then you know everything in between. Um, so we'll we'll spend some time today just kind of generally discussing uh, legal issues um, and options that you have in starting and operating a business. Um, I should be upfront in saying that, uh, I am not providing specific legal advice to anyone on the call today. Um, this is general information. If you have um, questions or issues that are very specific to your business, I encourage you to seek out an attorney like myself or someone else you may have a relationship with so that you can get uh, very specifically tailored advice um, on your situation. So with that kind of background information um, resolved and behind us, we can move forward and and talking about all the fun legal and tax issues and starting a business. I always start off my presentations with some quote. Uh, this one is applicable to um, you know, many of my clients who have ideas and who are starting a business. You know, the idea phase, the, the kind of uh, the, the beginning part of coming together with business partners or, or by yourself to, to start your business and um, you know, come up with the product, that, that is, um, a lot of, you know, it can be fun, um, you know, that's kind of the exciting part. Uh, it's the follow through, in my experience, that really um, distinguishes between you know, successful business owners and, and those of my clients who, who may never really get off the ground. So um, keep in mind, it's, it's what you do with it. It's not necessarily the idea uh, that, that really has value. Um, a little bit of a roadmap, you can go to the next slide, Lori. A little bit of a roadmap of what we're going to talk about today. We'll spend the, the bulk of our time talking about uh, legal structures and ent business entities that you can use for your business, corporations, LLCs, those types of things. Um, let you know the options that you have, what so the, the pros and cons of, of those entities are. We'll talk a little bit about regulatory issues, although Lori did a pretty good job um, of hitting on those. Uh, we'll talk about taxes, um, at least make you aware of the types of taxes that most small businesses encounter. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about employee issues and contracts towards the end of the presentation as well. Um, you know, why should I care? Uh, all of these things are important. Um, you know, one, protecting your personal assets. That's the, the key reason why most people go to attorneys or you know, form a formal business entity. Um, you don't want your personal assets at stake. If someone sues you, if a creditor comes after the business, um, if you set this up the right way, then, then your personal assets, your home, your car, your personal belongings um, won't be at risk uh, for, those, uh, for those liabilities. Um, ease of administration, having formal policies in place, especially if you have business partners, um, that becomes really critical and key in, in avoiding disputes and, and getting your business tied up in litigation. Tax benefits, um, you know, proper planning on the front end can really make sure that um, you're, you're paying as, as little taxes as is legally possible. Um, and, and for many of these tax programs and benefits and tax breaks that, that are available to small businesses, you know, there are things that you kind of have to set everything up in the beginning to take advantage of those. It, it's a lot of times it's hard to kind of shift midway through. Uh, avoiding litigation, as long as my, my partners down the hall don't hear me say this, um, a big part of my job in, in any business and transactional attorney, what we do is to try to make sure that you don't need the other attorneys at our law firm. We try to keep you out of litigation, um, whether it's through you know, partnership agreements, operating agreements with your owners or you know, contracts with your customers, we try to draft those in a way where, um, you know, the known risks are contemplated and addressed in a way in those agreements that um, you don't end up in, in years and years of litigation that can tie up your business. Transferability of ownership is a key uh, issue in many small businesses. 
again, um, if you have business partners, most people are going into business with those specific business partners who they contemplated. Um, and you know, you, you don't necessarily want your business partners to be able to transfer their ownership to somebody that you don't know or trust. Um, and, and if you have documentation for your company, you can make sure that, that the ownership group stays within kind of the group of people that were intended in the front end. Managing cash flows, just, just having a good set of books and financials is, is going to be key, uh, especially as we get to Ryan's portion of this presentation. That's something that lenders are going to look at to, to approve you for, for financing and loans. And so that's, that's a key issue as well. Finally, protecting your intellectual property. Um, you know, especially if you have, if you're operating in the tech space, you have an app that you're getting developed, if you have employees or independent contractors, especially who you've hired to create that technology or that app or that software, um, you need proper agreements in place uh, to ensure that you or your company is the owner of that intellectual property and not uh, the person who created it or developed it. Um, so from there, we will kind of just go into the first prong on that roadmap, which is structuring your business. Um, I want to give you a very kind of broad overview to start at, at what your options are. Um, we'll talk a little bit about sole proprietorships and partnerships uh, at the beginning of the presentation. Uh, the key takeaway, hopefully from, from the time we spend on, on those topics, is that you don't want to be a sole proprietorship or a partnership. Um, that's kind of the default rule if you don't take a step uh, in order to form a corporation or an LLC and you know there's a lot of issues and potential risks with operating under those two forms of, of business so um, we'll kind of provide some background info there so that you understand a little bit more about why people form corporations and why people form LLCs. Um, then we'll talk about corporations. Um, you see there S Corps and C Corps those are really tax um, differences between those two. Legally, it's still a corporation. And then uh, from there, we will talk about LLCs, which is, you know, kind of probably what most of you will encounter in practice. That's that's typically what most small businesses um, use as, as the preferred um, entity vehicle for their business. Okay, so we'll talk about sole proprietorships uh, at first. You see here, little Timmy's got a lemonade stand. Uh, he didn't go out and form an LLC or corporation or anything. He just set up shop in his front yard. Um, and this is true of any business, um, any person who is operating act commercial activity for profit as part of a business, um, you are in the eyes of the law, a sole proprietorship. Sole proprietorships, uh, legally there's no distinction between the human individual and the business. So the debts of the business are the debts of the individual. The debts of the individual are the debts of the business. Um, the assets of the individual are the assets of the business. There's legally no uh, distinction or separation between you know, the person operating the business um, personally and then, and then the business assets as well. Again, no liability protection. Um, there's no filing. There's nothing you have to do to create a sole proprietorship. Again, that's just what happens uh, when one person goes into business on their own. Um, you still, if you are doing this, even if you're not a corporation or an LLC, you still have to have the right permits and licenses to operate that kind of business. Um, and you're supposed to register the name of the business with the county in which um, you operate in. Um, again, sole proprietorship, that's going to be one person. Um, if, if little Timmy here in his lemonade stand, if, if he has a bad batch and sends 10 people in the neighborhood to the hospital, then his personal assets um, are at risk if any of those people sue him for negligence or, or any sort of other type of legal claim. From there, we'll compare the sole proprietorship with the general partnership. You see now Timmy brought in some of his neighborhood friends, um, and now there's four of them that are engaging in this lemonade stand. All of the same things we just talked about for sole proprietorships are true of a general partnership. Um, there's no official filing or document that has to be signed or created. Um, there's, there's no liability protection. The assets of each individual business owner are the same as the business itself. Same thing for its liabilities. Um, you know, you can in situations like this have a partnership agreement that just kind of outlines you know, what percentage each person owns, 
um, you know, how decisions are made, you know, all of those types of things, but it's not required. Um, the big thing in general partnerships is that um, not only are you responsible personally for, you know, any liabilities of the business, um, you're also liable for any actions that any of your other partners make um, in furtherance of the business. And so um, if they have a uh, little big wheels with the, their lemonade stand logo plastered on the side and they get into a wreck in the neighborhood, um, if that wasn't, you know, if they were on a run to the grocery store or something to, to get more supplies, they were doing something in furtherance of the business. All of the business partners now are responsible legally for any liabilities that arise out of, out of that accident. Um, you know, any other lawsuits or liabilities that come up for a business, um, you're responsible for all of those individually, whether or not the business incurred it or one of your other partners incurred that liability. Um, so the big takeaway here is uh, a lot of risk. You're not only responsible for your own actions, you're responsible for all of your business partners' actions. Um, and general partnerships are created even if you didn't necessarily uh, have an affirmative agreement. You don't have to necessarily say, hey, we're all going to be part of a general partnership. Now, the way the law works is if if two or more people are engaging in a business venture for profit, uh, you have created a general partnership. There's no um, explicit agreement that has to be created or anything like that. And so, you know, for most people that are, are engaging in any sort of business or commercial activity, if you're doing it, you know, with a business partner and you haven't formed an LLC, you haven't formed a corporation or any sort of vehicle like that, you're doing it in a general partnership and, you know, there's a, a significant amount of, of liability involved. So um, that's kind of the background. That's kind of the default rules. Uh, if you haven't taken those steps to create an entity, um, which hopefully most of you have or will do um, if you're starting up a business. So from there, we'll kind of move into corporations. Uh, we'll start with corporations because they're kind of the oldest, the most traditional uh, legal business entity that most people are familiar with. Um, Arkansas has had corporations for 100 plus years. Um, every state has a corporation act. And so, um, you know, up until recently, which we'll talk about uh, when we get to the LLC part, most businesses um, were formed as corporations. Um, you know, corporations are, are kind of a formal business entity. They're by statute. There are a lot of you know, formal requirements that have to be complied with, um, or you run the risk of, of um, opening yourself up to personal liability, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, corporations, we'll talk about C corporations here. Um, if you've ever heard people talk about double taxation of corporations, um, they're talking about a C corporation. When you compare that with an S corporation, which is the next slide we'll talk about in a second, um, that avoids that double taxation issue. But corporations are legally separate from their own. So the corporation is a taxpayer. Um, the corporation is an entity in the eyes of the law. The corporation is responsible you know, for its debts and its liabilities and its contractual obligations, and it's responsible for paying its own taxes. And so because of that, the individual owners or shareholders are not necessarily responsible or liable um, for the, the liabilities of the tax payments and, and those types of things. There are ways if you're not doing the things you're supposed to be doing, um, shareholder that, that shareholders can be held personally liable or officers can be held personally liable. Um, you're always personally responsible and liable for your own negligence and for you know, any criminal or intentional misconduct. So just because um, you, know, you, you commit a crime in the name of a corporation doesn't mean that you aren't still personally responsible for, for the consequences and subject to um, criminal and civil uh, liability as well. Uh, but again, if you do everything you're supposed to do and, and outside of that context, shareholders are not responsible for the debts or liabilities of the company. Um, you form a corporation in Arkansas by filing the Articles of Incorporation. Um, that's a very simple, usually one, two, three page document. Um, that lists out some very basic information about the corporation. You file that with the Secretary of State's office. Um, and then you also have a set of bylaws um, that govern your corporation um, that address things like shareholders meetings and board meetings and um, how management decisions are made and officers and things of that nature. It's really, it's really kind of an administrative document. Um, that's 
not filed anywhere, you keep that, um, you know, internally when the books and, and records of the company, um, kind of the management structure of a corporation is, is you have, there's really kind of three parties. I always kind of think about this similar to our government and the way it's structured. You kind of have three different branches of power within a corporation. Each one has checks and balances on the other. And so, you know, we talk about shareholders, uh, shareholders are the owners of the corporation. Uh, they have little to no involvement in the actual management or the day-to-day -day operations of the company. Really, the only thing that shareholders do in that regard is once a year, they elect uh, the board of directors. So corporation by corporations by statute are required to have at least one shareholders meeting every year. At that one shareholders meeting, um, the shareholders are required to elect a board of directors. In Arkansas, a board of directors can be one person, it can be 15 people um, or anywhere in between. So even though it's a board, you know, for most small businesses, especially small businesses that have one owner, it's just you, or maybe it's you and your husband or wife or spouse, um, it's not uncommon, uncommon at all um, for a corporation to just have one member of the board. And that one member of the board is probably also the president and you know, the majority shareholder, that's, that's completely fine. Uh, and there's no requirement that you have, you know, more than one or like a formal three, five member uh, board of directors. Um, you still have, you have annual franchise taxes that you have to pay as a corporation. Um, you know, because the corporation is separate from its owners, you have to treat the corporation as its own separate entity. Um, and what that means is that you need to have a bank account in the name of the corporation. You need to pay um, your personal expenses out of your personal account. You don't need to pay your personal credit card bill uh, using checks from the corporate uh, checking account or, or pay personal bills with the corporate, the corporate credit card. You really have to keep those things separate. Again, in a very basic example where, um, you know, one person is the owner, the president, and, and the board, you really need to take, you know, write a check from the corporate bank account to yourself as the shareholder, transfer that money into your personal account. Um, one way, one of the ways that courts um, can make shareholders and officers and directors personally responsible um, for the debts or liabilities of the corporation um, is through commingling assets. Uh, there are, we have case law where the Supreme Court in Arkansas said, you know, if you're treating the corporation as just an alter ego of yourself, if you're commingling assets and funds, and if you're paying personal bills with corporate credit cards or corporate funds, then we're going to treat you as one entity, as one collective person as well. So in order to kind of get the benefits of, of a corporation, and, and keeping your personal assets separate from the corporate assets, you have to do the same thing. You have to keep the corporate assets separate from your personal assets. Um, we talked about double taxation just briefly. Um, in a C corporation, there's, there's two different taxes that occur before money can go out of the, the company's bank account and into you, your bank account as the owner. Um, so the corporation is a taxpayer. It calculates uh, the amount of profit that it has over a year. And then the corporation currently pays 21% uh, tax on, on the corporate profits. Historically, that number has been 35%. The tax cuts that happened a few years ago lowered that from 35% to 21%. So it's a little bit more of a manageable and palatable number than it used to be. Whatever's left over after those taxes are paid, you know, assuming that gets distributed to the shareholders that they then have access to that money and can spend it personally, there's another tax that happens at that step as well. Um, that is a dividend or a distribution um, that's taxed at capital gains rates. And so for most people, that's going to be 15% or 20% rate, you know, on top of the 21% that the corporation has already paid itself. So the double taxation, if you hear an accountant or CPA or, or anyone talk about that in a C-Corp and that you shouldn't be a C-Corp, um, it's those two taxes. It's, it's the corporate tax itself and then the dividend tax to get that money actually into the hands of the shareholders. So Congress in the 50s uh, wanted to avoid this problem of double taxation and wanted to allow 
you know, small business corporations, the ability to have pass through treatment. Uh, pass through treatment means that the corporation itself doesn't pay the tax. The corporation calculates the amount of profit and the amount of taxes um, that would be owed on, on those corporate profits. But then instead of paying it, that information just gets passed through to the individual shareholders. And then you get a schedule that you attach to your personal tax return um, and you pay taxes as the owner on that pass through income. Um, that's what an S corporation allows you to do. Um, that is a designation that is, it's purely a, a tax designation. You know, if you go to the Secretary of State's website and you want to form a corporation, there's no distinction between forming a C corporation and an S corporation. You just form a corporation. And then if you want to be taxed as an S corp, you know, you or your attorney or your CPA or accountant will help you fill out uh, the necessary forms that you mail off to the IRS, and then you will elect to be treated as an S corporation. That's the big benefit um, of an S corp versus a C corp is that you don't have that double taxation. Instead, you pay taxes, um, you know, based on your own individual kind of whatever income tax bracket you're in personally, or essentially the, the tax rate that you're going to pay on the, the corporate profits. Um, you can still, in an S Corp, you can still be an employee. Uh, you can pay yourself a reasonable wage uh, for your services that are provided. And that's considered, you know, an expense of the business in the same way that any other, um, you know, salary for employees would be treated. Um, you'd be eligible for, you know, benefits and, you know, all of the other uh, perks of being an employee that your company offers. Um, the big drawback of an S Corp, uh, let, let me say this, almost... For small businesses, uh, almost every CPA or accountant that you talk to will recommend that you be an S Corp. Um, and, and the reason why they recommend being an S Corp is because there are some self-employment taxes that you can avoid uh, as an S Corp um, as compared to being an LLC that's taxed as a partnership. So um, self-employment taxes, if you're not familiar with those, um, if you're a W-2 employee um, and you get your wage statement every every you know, other week or month, uh, you'll you'll see on your 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 pay stub that the company's taken out you know a portion of of taxes for FICA and for Medicare and Medicaid. Um, it's all of those payroll taxes. It amounts to about seven and a half percent of your income when you're an employee. What's not on your pay stub is the employer the company pays. Um, a matching amount, about seven and a half percent of the FICA and all of those things as well. So um, that's an expense that your employer uh, bears the burden of and pays. When you are an owner of a business, whether it's an S Corp or um, a partnership, which we'll talk about in a second, um, the profits of the business are not only subject to normal you know, income taxes, they're, they're subject to self-employment taxes which is all 15% of that FICA, Social Security, uh, Medicare, all of those things. When, you're, when you are the owner of the business, the IRS treats you as the employee and the employer. So you pay you know, the full 15% yourself. In an S Corp, there are some creative ways where you can kind of chip away at some of those self-employment taxes. Um, for that reason, you know, most CPAs tell you and, and will give you the advice that you should uh, be an S Corp for tax purposes. And, you know, generally speaking, for most small businesses, that's probably good advice. There are some drawbacks for S Corps that CPAs don't always tell you about. So I, I always like to kind of spend a little bit of time talking about those um, during these presentations. One is th there are restrictions on who can be owners of S Corps. And so all owners, whether they own 1%, you know, 10%, 100%, have to be living, breathing humans. Um, I mean, they have to be individuals. What that means is that you know, other LLCs, other corporations, other business entities um, can't be owners of an S Corp. Um, you know, for some people, again, that may not be an issue, but where that does become an issue for clients, what we've seen in practice is, you know, we a client has made an S corp election, and then a year or two later, later they want to raise money from investors. They want to go out and find some people who are willing to invest um, and buy stock in the company, and they're trying to raise private equity 
um, you know, VC type of money. And all of the, that type of, you know, investors, they're not typically investing in their individual name. You know, maybe your friends and family, if they want to invest in the company, they're fine doing it just in their individual personal name. And in that case, you wouldn't have an issue uh, being an escort. But if you're trying to go raise money from institutional funds or money, people that invest through LLCs or limited partnerships, uh, being an escort becomes an issue and a problem. And in fact, you just you have to undo the escort collection uh, somehow at that point. Um, so the the, all shareholders have to be, you know, individuals. You also can't have any foreign uh, shareholders. Everyone has to be U.S. citizens. And then, you know, the last kind of restriction is is you can only have one class of stock. Um, again, for most just kind of simple, straightforward businesses, the one class of stock rule isn't a problem. Uh, but in more complicated ones, especially again where you're trying to raise money, um, if you've heard. You know, people talk about Series A stock or Series B financing, Series C. Um, those companies issue different types of shares in their company, and each type of share has, you know, different rights to dividends or different rights to voting. You know, they may be able to appoint more members to the board. Um, so, in some of those, again, more kind of complicated. Um, usually, you see these kind of in the tech space or in the uh, venture capital world. S corps are really bad vehicles uh, for those types of business. Um, from there, uh, LLCs. So a little bit of background here. Uh, in Arkansas, LLCs did not exist until 1993. Um, in most places, that is true. Wyoming was the first state to create an LLC. Uh, people wanted the limited liability of a corporation, um, but they wanted the benefits of pass through. Uh, taxation of a partnership. That's why LLCs were really created in the first place. Uh, during the 80s, the IRS really fought hard uh, against LLCs. There was a lot of litigation throughout the 80s until 1988 when the IRS just kind of gave up and said, fine, we'll let you be taxed as a partnership with that flow through treatment. Um, once that happened, states all across the country started enacting statutes uh, that allowed you to create an LLC. So as we talked about, um, Arkansas's LLC statute has only been around for about 30 years. In fact, last year, we completely replaced our LLC statute with a new one. So the current version of Arkansas's LLC Act has really only been around for about a year. Um, so it's still relatively new, even for attorneys. There are questions and some unknowns out there uh, because courts haven't really had a chance to, to litigate you know, some of the gray areas. But the background of me telling you all of that is that you know, in Arkansas, again, 1993 was when we first had LLCs. The tax code that we are using today was enacted in 1986. Because of that, our tax code does not contemplate LLCs. There's no such thing under our tax code of being taxed as a limited liability company. Um, you know, the, so because, again, it, it predated LLCs even existing, so now because of that, the IRS essentially lets you choose how you want to be taxed. There are some limitations to that, but if you're an LLC, you can choose to be taxed as a partnership or, or a sole proprietorship disregarded entity. Um, you can choose to be taxed as a C corporation. You can choose to be taxed as an S corporation. So in those scenarios, you know, legally you're an LLC, but for tax purposes, you're going to be something else. Um, it's important for you to know that and keep that in mind. There's ways of changing um, your tax structure as an LLC. The IRS has a default set of rules, um, but then there's a form that you can file to change uh, the tax classification from the default. So um, that's kind of the overall just kind of tax structure of LLCs. Again, you want to be an LLC taxed as an S Corp. That's a pretty common uh, structure for small businesses. That's completely fine. You just need to make sure you handle those S Corp filings appropriately. A um, little bit of just kind of nomenclature. Um, owners of an LLC are called members. Um, they're not called shareholders, they're called members. Um, the people in charge of the LLC are called managers or managing members. Um, so you don't have a board of directors. Um, you can have a president or you know, vice president or officers of an LLC if you want. Um, that's permissible, 
um, but owners are going to be called members. The, the nice thing about LLCs, there's a lot less formalities about LLCs than you see with corporations. You know, with corporations, you have to have bylaws, you have to have shareholder, you know, stock certificates by statute, you have to have an annual shareholders meeting, you have to have an annual directors meeting. Um, if you really go into the corporate statutes, there's just a lot of formality and a lot of requirements that you have to satisfy, again, in order to, to keep the benefit of limited liability. Uh, for an LLC, we really don't have any of that. Uh, you have to form the LLC, you have to pay $150 in franchise taxes every year to the Secretary of State. Um, outside of that, there's not really much else that is required. Um, LLC, the governing document of an LLC is called an operating agreement. That usually is, a, is, is the most important document for LLCs, especially if you have business partners, uh, because that document is going to outline you know, who is the managing member or the manager, who has the ability to you know, sign contracts or make certain decisions. Um, you know, in a 50-50 in a um, you know, LLC, does it require 100% uh, unanimous approval in order to take certain actions to go and you know, enter into a loan or, or you know, maybe you want to bring in another owner in the future or issue additional uh, membership interests. Um, the operating agreement is going to outline the process for how that is done. And um, the operating agreement, you know, will also discuss things like transferability. We talked about in the corporate setting, um, you know, your shares in the in a, your shares in a corporation can be transferred freely. Um, pretty much however you want, unless there is an agreement or some sort of document that everyone signs in a corporation saying, hey, you won't sell your shares to a competitor or you won't sell your shares to this person, you can pretty much do that um, in the corporate setting. In a LLC setting, most operating agreements are going to have you know, language and provisions in there that, that really prevent and restrict your ability to you know, just sell your ownership to someone else or there's usually a process in there about what happens if an owner wants to quit or get out or you know, what happens if, if they die or become disabled. All of those things are, are ironed out in the operating agreement. However, our LLC Act doesn't even require you to have a written operating agreement. Um, if you don't have one, the LLC Act will kind of imply one for you. Um, and they've, you know, our act even says that an operating agreement can be created you know, implicitly through actions, through informal conversations. And so again, LLCs are just very kind of fast and loose, not a lot of formalities that are required. You don't have to have, you know, annual meetings and, you know, voting on um, officers or directors, managers, things like that. You, you can do all of those things um, if you want to um, have that level of formality, but it's not required. I'm a big distinction between LLCs and S-Corps for tax purposes, they're very similar, um, but you don't have all of those ownership restrictions in an LLC that you do in an S-Corp. So now with, with one caveat, if you're an LLC that has elected to be taxed as an S-Corporation, all of those restrictions apply around individual owners and one class of stock. Uh, but most people, if they wanna avoid that, you can be an LLC that's taxed as a partnership Partnerships and S corps, from a tax perspective, are are similar, if not the same, and 99% of the time. And so, um, if you want those pass through benefits of taxation, you can be an LLC partnership and not an LLC taxed as an S corporation. Um, limited liability. Again, this is just the whole the whole reason why most people go to an attorney or, or want to form an LLC or a corporation. Um, in the first place, LLCs and corporations offer limited liability to all owners, means that the, the financial liability for the company's debts, you know, are limited to the amount of money that you have put into the company. If you do an initial, you know, $10,000 investment, yeah, that $10,000 that has been transferred into the company's bank account, that is at risk. Uh, but your personal assets, things in your personal name that you haven't transferred into the, the company, those are not going to be at risk. That's the benefit of limited liability. You know, creditors will sue the business, not the individual owners. There are a lot of times where they will try to find ways to be able to sue the individual owner. Um, a lot of times, you know, LLCs and corporations have very little assets. And so, you know, the creditor wants to figure out a way to be able to go after you personally. 
Um, you know, the most traditional way you see that is through a personal guarantee. Um, if you take out a loan and the bank requires you not only for the business to sign the loan agreement, but for you to personally guarantee, you know, that debt, then through that, you know, agreement, which you've signed, um, you now have become personally responsible for, for that liability or that debt. Um, but, you know, absent some sort of issue like that, absent fraud, intentional misconduct, you know, criminal conduct, you know, you're not as an individual owner going to be responsible for um, the business's debts. Piercing the corporate veil, that's kind of the concept we talked about earlier, which is if you want the benefits of limited liability, of a court saying that the you know, businesses, um, assets or liabilities are separate from your individual and personal uh, assets and liabilities, then you have to also maintain that same separateness. Um, you have to treat your business as a separate entity. You have to um, it, you know, make sure that you handle financial transactions appropriately, that you are handling those in the same way you would with, with any other third party. Um, if you don't, piercing the corporate veil, that's the the concept, uh, the term that courts use in order to, to remove that limited liability. So trying to avoid that situation from happening if at all possible. Okay, so that gives you kind of a, a broad overview on you know, the options that are available to you. Here's a quick comparison that I really just put in here um, for, the, for the slide so that you kind of have some of this information in a very easily um, accessible way. Um, Things you should think about, you know, really before you start the business, um, in addition to, you know, should it be an LLC, should it be a corporation? Um, you know, one of the most important things that you can do, and, and you can go to the next slide, Lori. Um, one of the next important, most important things that you can do is doing a name availability search, you know, running a trademark search on your business. You, you know, the Secretary of State, you know, the Secretary of State will allow me today to form an LLC that's called McDonald's Hamburgers LLC. You know, as long as somebody else isn't using that name, the Secretary of State is going to allow me to form a company with that name. Um, so a lot of people will say, hey, uh, this name's available with the Secretary of State, so you know, I'm gonna move forward with that name. Well, that's not the, the end of the analysis by any means. We have trademark office that's, that's national, um, names and logos and words are trademarked by certain businesses. And, you know, in that example, I could form a company called McDonald's Hamburgers. I could go and get a loan in the name of McDonald's Hamburgers. I could open up a fast food restaurant with Golden Arches and, you know, McDonald's, Ham all of that. And, you know, I might be able to get away with it for a couple months or maybe it's a couple of years. Um, but at some point, Usually, once I've become successful, once I am now on the map, once I've expanded into four, five, six, seven, you know, 10 locations, McDonald's is going to catch wind of this. They're going to send me a cease and desist letter. It's going to say, you're violating our trademark. Um, you need to cease all use of this trademark anywhere in the United States. And then I'm sitting here with hundreds of thousands of dollars of signage and branding and marketing that I've not done in the name of this business. And I've got to undo all of it. I've got to rebrand. I've got to find a different um, you know, name for my company because I didn't do a trademark search whenever I first um, set my business up. And so, um, you know, make sure that, you know, at a minimum, you know, you're talking to Lori or somebody doing some market research on, you know, the name, uh, do a Google search, see if anybody else is using it, uh, you know, in your same type of business. And then, you, know, you can also go to the U.S. Trademark Office's website and search um, to see if other businesses are using your name. The main thing with trademarks is that you can't use you know, the same or similar name in the same or similar business. Um, you know, theoretically, I could have a law firm called the McDonald's Law Firm uh, because you know, really what we're trying to do with trademarks is we're trying not to confuse people. And the law says that you know, if I'm looking for a fast food restaurant under the name McDonald's and I drive past the McDonald's law firm, I'm not going to be confused by that. I'm not going to think that I could go in there and get a hamburger. Um, and so it's not to say that just because somebody has that name trademark that you can't use it. It really has to be, you know, something that's similar to what you're doing. And, and then that 
you know, becomes a whole analysis as well um, that you can do yourself. Attorneys, we have trademark and, and IP attorneys here, as most law firms do, who can kind of help you with that process. Um, determining your tax status, we've talked about all this. Are you going to be an LLC? Okay, well, if you are going to be an LLC, you're going to be a partnership, an S Corp. Um, what does that conversation look like? Do those restrictions that come with S Corp status, you know, are, are those really going to apply to your business? If not, um, then you can move forward with your tax status at that point. You know, developing a relationship with an attorney and a CPA slash accountant who has uh, experience and knowledge working with small businesses is key. You know, I consistently tell people that a good CPA is going to save you more money than, than what they cost. Um, and, and I highly recommend that everybody, you know, if you haven't already, if you're running a business, if you're about to, um, that you really kind of start that, that relationship with a CPA or accountant who can help you out. Um, yeah, and, and then employment law issues as well is, is an important consideration. If you're going to have a lot of employees, you know, you're going to need an employee handbook and, and either an attorney or an HR person who has experience handling those type of issues. Um, Key questions for founders um, is the next slide things that business owners need to consider and think about, you know, before you jump into it. Uh, you know, most of these issues and are, are really issues that need to be addressed up front. You know, once you've encountered these in practice, most of the time it's too late to do anything about them. So, you know, what we do as business attorneys is work with clients to make sure that if some of these issues or some of these um, concerns that they have arise that we've put very clear, easy to understand processes in place and their agreements on the front end so that, you know, when that time comes, again, we're not in months or years of litigation because we've already thought about this. We've already put, um, you know, a solution in place in your documents. But, you know, things to think about what happens if one of your founders or, you know, business partners leaves, you know, a common misconception is that if someone quits or they don't, you know, they, they no longer want to work for the business or be involved, that they automatically forfeit their ownership. Um, I work with a lot of clients who will say, yeah, we used to have a, somebody who owned, you know, a third of the company, but they quit and they moved to California and they're not involved anymore. So they don't, you know, they don't have any ownership anymore. And, and that's not true. You know, your ownership is not tied uh, to being involved in the business or working for the business, um, unless your documents say they are. So that's, you know, one of the things we do is we'll put in an operating agreement or in a, in a shareholders agreement that says, you know, if you quit or get fired or, you know, for whatever reason, you know, you want to depart from the business, there is a process for you either selling or forfeiting, you know, your equity in this business or, um, you know, somehow we've addressed that in the document so that we're not stuck in the scenario where now you've got a one third owner living in California who, by the time you ask him uh, about this issue, he says, ah, you know what, I'm, I'm just going to hold on to my one third ownership. I don't I don't want to have to sell that back or forfeit that ownership. I like having a third ownership without doing anything. So we try to, you know, forecast those issues again, put solutions in place in your documents. Um, you know, if people are getting ownership or equity in your business in order to, uh, in, in exchange for their services, you know, sweat equity, um, you know, what does that commitment look like? Again, something we see a lot in practice is you have two people who have agreed to be 50-50 owners uh, on the understanding that they're both going to work full-time for the business, but one of them doesn't. One of them maybe is only working five to 10 hours and isn't really uh, upholding their end of the bargain well, unless you've put something in your documents to either adjust the ownership or, or address this in a way, you know, that person gets to continue being a 50% owner. Um, you know, how can founders be removed? How will a sale of the business or any, any important decision, how will that be decided? Uh, again, you know, another kind of common um, structure is you have three owners and each one of them owns a third of the business. Um, what happens if two of the three want to sell the business or what happens if two of the three want to bring in another owner or want to dilute the other founders ownership interest in the business. You know, the, the default rule is that a majority of the owners can decide. Um, but what we do a lot of times in these documents is we say, okay, for these handful of issues or items, for these 10 things, 
uh, we're going to require unanimous approval because we don't think it's fair um, for someone to get diluted or for the business to be sold uh, without all three owners being in agreement on that uh, transaction or that decision. So things like that we can address on the front end. If they're not addressed on the front end and they happen, there's very little that we can do about it um, at that time. You know, 50-50 businesses, you know, what happens if there's a dispute? How do you resolve that? Um, the law does not have a good way to resolve uh, 50 disputes in a 50-50 ownership setting. Basically, what the law says is, well, you can just dissolve the company if you want. You can just shut everything down and, you know, distribute out the assets 50-50. It's kind of like the King Solomon approach of just like chopping the baby in half. Um, so unless you want that as the solution, you know, what we, again, what we will do, what you need to do as a founder, at least to think about, um, is implementing a dispute resolution process you know, in your documents to, to avoid that from happening. Quickly, because I know we're running out of time, um, I'll just kind of go through some, some final issues on regulatory and licensing. This is really, again, uh, just to have in your slides, it's some helpful information. Um, you need to make sure, as Lori mentioned, if you're having an at-home business, you're checking and making sure that um, you know, your neighborhood doesn't have a POA or, or some sort of restriction on your ability to operate a business out of your home. You need to make sure the zoning laws in your city allow you to run that type of business. Um, you know, certain businesses need a specific type of license. So you need to check with, you know, the Department of Health or um, ABC, whatever it is, make sure that you have the appropriate licenses uh, to conduct your business. You'll need to get a sales and use tax permit, most likely. Um, and you'll need to get a tax ID number or an EIN from the IRS. Um, that's essentially a social security number for your business and it allows the IRS to keep track of your, um, of all of the, the kind of tax filings and documents that are related to your, to your company. Uh, taxes, again, we're not gonna spend time in, in detail going through every single one of these. Um, Lori, you can go to the next page if you don't mind. Um, this is really just to tell you, look, there's a lot of taxes. You need to develop a relationship with a CPA or an accountant or a tax attorney who can help you um, navigate through all this because you're going to have self sales and use tax. As a business owner, we talked about it. You're going to have self-employment tax that incorporates Social Security and Medicare. You're going to have withholding taxes, um, unemployment taxes. You have franchise taxes that you have to pay to the Secretary of State every year. Um, and that's all in addition to, you know, your federal and state income taxes um, that are due on your actual income and profits derived from the business. So um, this is just a sampling of, of tax issues to be aware of. There's a lot of, um, you know, detail that goes into that. And you should definitely consult with a CPA um, or a tax professional to understand those. Uh, the next slide, those are just some tax resources that I, I always put in the slides just so that um, you can consult those at your uh, convenience. And then finally, we'll just kind of briefly touch on, you know, commercial contracts. Again, this is such a broad kind of topic. We don't have time to go into every single one of these in detail. Um, it, what I see in practice is, is um, most disputes, most litigation, most just issues that arise, arise through some form of commercial contracts. Um, whether that is, you know, financing or loan agreements or customer, you know, customer contracts for the sale of goods, um, IP contracts, you know, contracts with your vendors and suppliers. Most people just sign those and don't read them. Uh, I mean, frankly, uh, that's what most of my clients do. If that's your approach, um, you know, there's only so much that your attorney can do afterwards. And so reading those on the front end and making sure you understand them, making sure you understand the risks uh, that are being placed onto your business by signing those contracts is, um, it is really important. You know, non-solicitation provisions um, can be just kind of thrown into all kinds of contracts. And if you're not paying attention, you know, those types of non-solicitation or non-compete um, clauses can kind of catch you off guard. I've seen that happen in practice several times where um, a client signed a contract saying they won't use any other vendor or supplier that they're going to, we're going to sign an exclusive, you know, supplier agreement and you know, they didn't realize that. And so then um, they get sued or at least get uh, an angry letter from the other side um, alleging that we're in breach. And so 
you know, the big takeaway from this slide is, is just making sure that you read, you know, these contracts. You, there's may not always be, you know, the ability to negotiate them. You may not always be able to get the people on the other side to change the terms. Um, but at a minimum, you should make sure that you understand what those risks are so that you can avoid them um, in practice and then the way that you actually go about, um, you know, carrying out that, that relationship. So with that, I will stop. Um, there's some information for me if you'd like to get a hold of me. Um, usually I stick around afterwards and you know, chit chat and answer people's questions. We can't really do that in the virtual setting, but um, there's my contact info and we may have a, a Q&A session later that I'll stick around for. But um, if you have questions, you can contact with me that way. Otherwise, I'll turn this back over to Lori. Lori, I think you're on mute. Okay, sorry. Um, thank you, Cal. We really appreciate all of this information. That was very uh, valuable. And now I'll turn it over to Ryan, who is from Arvest, and he is a commercial lender. And we are so happy he is here um, to talk all about um, financing and other pieces of just kind of the financial side of business. But this is really valuable information for everyone. Thanks, Lori. Uh, appreciate you including me. Uh, sorry that my video is not live, but uh, that's what I looked like about seven years ago when I joined Arvest Bank. Uh, I've been in the banking industry uh, for 17 years and, like I say, been at Arvest for seven. Uh, my wife and I also were business owners. We owned the Fayetteville Jazzercise location for several years, so um, have been in the shoes of some of the folks on the phone trying to figure out uh, just how to navigate being a business owner in Arkansas. And then uh, now as my career spend uh, most of my time trying to help folks uh, navigate those same questions. Um, when it comes to financing, Lori uh, set me up pretty good by saying that uh, you want to get a lot of that information uh, ready uh, on the front end. And, and Cal kind of set me up too on um you know, getting those documents in place and those things. So um, there's several sources of financing that um, you can see business owners use to get going or to expand or to continue operations. Uh, their own savings accounts uh, are, uh, you know, kind of the easiest source to see. This money is already in the bank and I'm willing to put it into the business. Um, that certainly works. Um, I will add to, I do have the question and answer um, screen up on the side of mine. So if you have a question that pops up while I'm going through these, feel free to uh, uh, to type it in there and I will notice it. Normally when we're in person, uh, I ask for questions at the end of each slide, but probably not going to do that as we're working through it here online. Um, additional sources of financing, family and friends. If you've got a rich uncle, that's always a good thing. Um you know, cash that uh, people will put in. There can be tax consequences on those. I can't give you tax advice, but uh, uh, those are things to visit with your CPA and or uh, family attorneys about. Uh, but there's difference between gifts, loans, those type of things. Um, equipment leasing companies, let's say you were looking to start a gym and all you needed were a couple of treadmills, you may be able to go to a company and lease those. Similar with um, equipment, uh, backhoes, um, industrial equipment. A lot of times the companies that manufacture those will have a lease uh, option. But to Cal's earlier point, read those leases. Some of those you own the, the equipment when you're done, uh, others you don't. Um, and there can, you know, be some, some fine print in there. It can be a good, uh, uh, option though, for longer terms or, um, depending on the industry and, and market conditions, sometimes there are, um, you know, very low interest rates on some of those leases. Bank financing, uh, goes one of two ways. Usually, uh, in-house loan is what we would call our standard structure. Um, most banks are going to be, um, a five-year maturity or less on their loans um, for equipment or things. That's probably about as long as you want to finance them. If there's real estate, uh, that usually goes longer. So what you're going to see on a standard bank loan is a maturity 
Uh, some people will call it a balloon, but those loans are meant to be worked, reworked every three to five years. Um, SBA guarantee, we'll talk a little bit more in detail about that here in just a minute, but uh, that is a um, credit enhancement tool that allows banks to lend on requests that are outside of their normal loan policy or risk profile. Uh, venture capitalist, um, these are folks uh, you might think Shark Tank are venture capitalist. There are non-TV uh, versions of that available in the local market. Uh, Startup Junkie is one that comes to mind um, in, in Fayetteville. Uh, there are some other local Northwest Arkansas venture capitalist groups, as well as uh, people that specialize in uh, specific industries that they are looking to expand in or have knowledge in. Venture capitalists are usually looking for something back from you for their capital. Uh, that's ownership or a higher guaranteed return in, in the future. So they tend to be more flexible than uh, what you would see out of traditional bank or SBA financing. Um, but um, may want to be very cognizant of what, what they're asking for in return. And then crowdfunding is if you have a really good idea that you think people would get behind um, and you want to raise some of the capital that you need to get going. Um, this is like Kickstarter, um, some of those things saying, hey, uh, if you want to put a deposit down on the first new cool widget that will be built, you guys will get them, you know, on the first run or, um, you know, in nonprofits, you see this, uh, hey, we want to build a shelter for all of the cute puppy dogs that are out here. And don't you love puppy dogs? Put $50 down and uh, be a supporting member. So a few different ways to finance. And most people will use more than one on that list. Um, just some general comments about obtaining the financing. You do want to get a commitment from whatever financing avenues you are taking before you sign any binding agreements, whether that is the lease on the space that you're going to occupy, um, a franchise agreement, a, an agreement to lease equipment, but you needed more operating money. If you sign those and then find out that the uh, financing is not going to be available for what you need, um, that does not absolve you of all of the things that you have just agreed to in that binding uh, document. So um, talk to your banker often, talk to your banker early. Um, when it comes to finding a bank to work with, uh, if you already have a relationship, that's a great place uh, to start. Um, and I would say it's, it's like any other major decision worth getting uh, a second or third opinion as well, too, to make sure that you're getting the best structure and um, option for you that's out there. Uh, don't expect to get a grant. Uh, grants are few and far between. There is um, some micro grant activity in Northwest Arkansas for, uh, for startups, but we're, you know, a couple of thousand dollars on that. Um, uh, but, you know, there's, there's not really a lot of grant money out there for for-profit businesses. Uh, they are looking more for existing nonprofits that have a specific need that will fit their, their grant programs. Uh, don't assume you can get a bank loan. I say talk to your banker early and often and get their opinion. And then uh, do not expect to get 100% financing. Um, there are ways to, uh, um, to get close, but uh, you will need skin in the game, whether that's from your own savings or um, assets and things that you already own and are willing to pledge. Um, as you're looking through your financing options, and Lori uh, touched on this a little bit, uh, you really want to fine tune and um, get into the details on your request for initial capital. Whether you're going to an investor, whether you're going to a bank, whether you're uh, completing an SBA application, sorry, go uh, um, you do want to be very um, thorough on your business plan and detail your list of your startup cost uh, with documentation. Uh, meaning if you think, hey, it's going to cost us roughly $100,000 to finish out this uh, space that we're going to, to lease, well, you're going to want a bid or something from a contractor that would be able to, to do it. Um, 
another thing that the SBTDC and, and Lori's team is good at um, helping with is creating these projections of expected sales, profits, and cash collections uh, with a three-year minimum. That is really key uh, uh, for SBA as well as even for um, just in-house bank lending and you as a business owner. Um, if you don't have a scorecard to rank yourself against, it's, it's difficult to know if you're doing well, uh, uh, being ahead of uh, projections or, or trailing and uh, don't really know what to measure yourself to. So um, that being said, I've never seen projections in any of the deals that I've looked at that someone has just hit exactly uh, where they thought they were going to be. So uh, do your best on trying to get realistic, achievable projections. Um, and then don't be too hard on yourself if if you miss them one month and exceed them the next month. Um, just use that to fine tune as, as you go through. Um, in that business plan too, or um, even if you're putting together just a, um, not a full formal business plan, but um, in a loan application, you want to summarize your history in the in the industry, update your resume. Um, most bankers are looking for solid operators. Uh, we want people that are involved in the business and, and know the business. Um, I have seen some requests where people are looking to assume a business that maybe they don't have uh, experience in, in which case you probably want to highlight who those key people in your business that you're acquiring uh, are going to be so that uh, we understand uh, how the business will continue to run and then highlight your skills as an operator that will help you uh, take it to the next level. On that initial financing request, describe how you're going to use the money. Um, again, if you've got 250000 in startup, we're going to want to know subtotals and uh, kind of line by line where that will be used. And then Describe your co your cash contributions. Uh, one thing that I see borrowers neglect to spell out a lot of times are the cash contributions that they have put into a project to get it to the stage where it is now. Uh, an example would be building a building. Um, there can be hundreds of thousands of dollars on the front end in engineering, in working with um, the city to meet their requirements, getting new plans drawn and all that kind of stuff. And then you come to the bank and say, I need half a million dollars to build this building. Well, if you didn't tell us that you already spent $100,000 and that this is really a $600,000 project, we're not going to know that. So um, keep records of, of cash you contribute at any stage in the process um, and also cash that you intend to put in as the business grows and moves forward. Um, we can move to the next slide here. The SBA, uh, we've mentioned a couple times. So the Small Business Administration, the SBA, is funded by the federal government. Uh, it is regulated at the federal level. Uh, they put out a new standard operating procedure every couple of years. And so what I'm going to address on the SBA stuff is some of what they do, some of what they don't do. And I didn't put a giant asterisk here, but uh, some of the stuff you'll see um, we have returned to normal during the pandemic. The SBA did a lot of stuff that they didn't normally do and that they are probably not going to do <laughs> again. So in general, the SBA uh, does help business owners obtain financing from a bank um, that is usually outside of what the bank would normally approve. Bankers, we like to live in the past. So when you come and say, hey, I would like to have a loan for my um popsicle business. It's a great, give me your last three years of tax returns uh, so that I can underwrite it. Well, that's good if, if you've been selling popsicles for 10 years and you've got a track record and things have been going well. Um, it's not necessarily um, something you're going to be able to produce if this is an idea or a startup or something you're looking forward to. So SBA, uh, by offering a guarantee on the loan, allows us to be a little more uh, reliant on projected income rather than historical income, and it can help us get around some of the collateral requirements. If you are buying a business or even if you're starting up, uh, sometimes it can be difficult uh, to have enough collateral to meet the bank's general requirements. Equipment we're usually 50 to 80 percent uh, advance rate on. Um, so the SBA sometimes can help us go to a, a higher level than that. It also allows for longer term financing. 
five to 10 years without real estate um, and up to 25 years with real estate. Um, that will help with your cash flow month to month. Typically, SBA loans are variable rate, um, but they will have a fixed portion in them. Um, an example that would be, let's say you're going to do a real estate loan. Uh, it's an SBA 7A. Um, you've got uh, five years fixed, and then you know that it will go to every five years, it'll adjust to Wall Street Journal Prime and fix in for the next five. So compared to a bank structure where you've got a hard maturity at five years, you may just have a repricing with SBA um, rather than a loan maturity. Uh, if you have significant personal assets, you will be required to pledge them uh, and all owners must guarantee personally. Uh, that last part of the sentence is true um, on bank financing as well too. If you own 20% of the LLC or the corporation, uh, you will be required to personally guarantee uh, a bank loan. There are very few exceptions to that. So uh, mark it down is pretty much a rule. And uh, uh, on the SBA, uh, they will have that same rule and they can go one step further. Um, let's say that you own 100% of your business, uh, but you're married, SBA can require a spousal guarantee, particularly if the spouse has assets or income that could help service the debt. Um, there are also some specific numbers on, you know, if you have uh, X amount of equity in your house percentage, they'll require it. Um, if you're pretty leveraged on the house, then, then they'll leave that asset off. So uh, just some basics on what SBA does. Um, a few other things that the SBA will do is charge you for a fee uh, for the guarantee. 3% is kind of the common. Um, that is really above, I want to say 250 right now. They raised it during the pandemic to 500,000. They waived the guarantee fee. Um, and so I believe it's back down to 250. And it depends on the type of SBA loan that you get. All of those fees would be disclosed to you prior to loan closing, and they can be added into your loan amount, which is, is the most common. Uh, if you are a veteran, uh, I have seen, depending on which version of the uh, standard operating procedure the SBA is operating under, where they would waive that uh, fee for U.S. veterans and spouses. Uh, SBA does look at your credit history. It does look at your score and um, it's a thorough process that will um, have some other questionnaires. So just uh, be transparent and be prepared to explain anything um, that uh, pops up on that credit history. They will also ask about, um, you know, criminal um, records. If you were uh, uh, charged with uh, bank fraud and embezzlement, you're probably not going to be eligible for an SBA loan. But uh, I did get an SBA loan approved for a gentleman that uh, had been in a uh, altercation in a, uh, uh, can I say bar fight? I guess he was in a bar fight in Colorado. Um, you know, he was able to provide all the letter and documentation and, and that did not stop his SBA process. Uh, I will say if he would have tried to hide it, it probably would have stopped his SBA process. So uh, be thorough, open and, and honest on your SBA forms. Even with an SBA, 10% uh, equity infusion is required for startups. Kind of back to that earlier point, there's just not a lot of 100% financing available out there. Um, things that the SBA does not do, uh, they do not make direct loans. Again, this is where my giant asterisk should, should pop up. Um, the SBA during the pandemic did offer the EIDL program. Um, there are some loans out there that are direct to customers from the SBA right now. That program is not currently open. Um, and um, I have worked with a few customers that uh, took some of those loans and uh, some will tell you they were a great idea and others would, would say that eh, maybe I shouldn't have done it. Uh, they do not offer grant money. Uh, they do not offer low interest loans. So by saying SBA, that doesn't mean you're gonna get necessarily the lowest interest loan out there. The caveat to that being the EIDL loans were pretty low long-term fixed rates. Um, and SBA offers a 504 program, which is really for real estate, um, for an operating company. But uh, 
on those loans, the the portion that is with the CDC, those interest rates have been pretty low um, over the last few years. Um, they do not allow for balloon notes. So if you get an SBA loan with your bank, like we talked about, you will probably have some repricing that goes uh, along with it, but you're not gonna see a statement that says you're due for the remaining balance. Record keeping, uh, you heard it mentioned before, uh, it's important for not piercing the corporate veil uh, that you operate your uh, entity separate from your personal. Uh, it's also better for your banker uh, to be able to uh, get clean information from you each year on what your business expenses are. And it's better for you as a business owner to be able to reconcile that cash flow and know really what the business is doing and um, uh, what it's able to uh, provide for you versus trying to have to sift, sift through a bank statement and figure that out. Uh, another thing to think about there too is if you build a business and decide you want to sell it, it's much easier to turn over full access uh, to all of those documents to a business broker, to a potential buyer, to their financing entity uh, when it doesn't have any of your personal information on it. Um, keeping a schedule of your business assets that you show, uh, showing a purchase price, the date, the serial number, um, that is important for, for you as the business owner, for your tax accountant, uh, as you're trying to work through your depreciation schedule. And if you have an SBA loan or if you have a bank loan that is secured by uh, your equipment, that's something that we're going to ask you for on an annual basis. So rather than having to come up and, and put it together once a year um, and, and call your banker bad names, um, if you've got that schedule out there and you're keeping it updated, it's just an easy file to, to send over. You want to maintain the business records uh, for three years or uh, depending on what else it is, maybe longer. Um, that is kind of our standard um, underwriting is to go back three years of, of tax returns and then try and get information on the current year as well, too. Um, and so that, that will help from a financing need and then just for your um, uh, information, if you need to go back and look at trends as well, too. Setting up something uh, with an accountant, a bookkeeping system. A lot of people use QuickBooks. Um, QuickBooks is as good. You'll get out of it um, the same quality as what you put into it. It's probably true for any accounting system. Um, so uh, working with an accountant, knowing what they're going to like. And if you're keeping up your records month to month, if you had projections to go back and track to, you're going to be in good shape. Um, I will tell you, I work with customers that, you know, once a year just dump bank statements and uh, receipts and things on their accountant and go, let me know how I did. Um, <laughs> that's, uh, that's tough on the accountant. I'm guessing their tax prep bill is probably higher than the ones that are setting something over for review and fine tuning and, and tax filing there. And it's really difficult to know if you get in a, in a cash bind or uh, it feels like you should be making more money and you don't know where it's going. If you don't have accurate um, statements on what you're doing um, month to month, day to day, it's, it's very difficult to figure out where you need to make changes to get things back on track. Uh, the IRS uh, updates their stuff on irs.gov. Uh, it's a fascinating read. You can find lots of information out there. And if you have trouble going to sleep, um, it, it will either put you straight to sleep or maybe keep you up all night, depending. Um, we touched on this earlier. Maintain a separate bank account for your business. Um, I would say you can have a bank account or bank accounts, whatever is best for you. Uh, I know a lot of small business uh, owners will start setting aside for taxes, have a separate tax account. A lot of them will do a separate account for payroll. Um, the point there being, if you're cutting checks out of that payroll account and something happens to a check, it gets um, altered or um, it sits on the sideline for six months before someone cashes it. It's not interrupting your operating funds. Mm -hmm. uh, reminder, do not commingle that personal money with your business money. Um, Get to know a bank loan officer before you need money. Uh, uh, there are additional services that banks offer besides giving loans uh, that can help your business run smoother. 
Um, most of the banks that you're gonna encounter in this area are relationship focused banks. There's not very many transactional loan only banks. Uh, so if you have several services with a bank, um, if your accounts are there, if your online banking is there, if you're um, using their corporate credit card for purchases, if you are uh, using their treasury management for accounts receivable, um, and accounts payable, uh, when you go to ask for a loan for expansion or growth, um, you're already going to be a known entity to them. And they're going to say, okay, well, this is one more thing that we're doing to, to uh, fulfill this this relationship. Um, if if they don't know anything about you, um, we we tend to guess conservatively when when we don't know. So uh, talk to bank loan officers early. Uh, start with the bank relationships you already have and expand if needed. And then once you do borrow money, um, keep keep the loan officer informed about your business. Um, you know, we we don't like surprises uh, and, and we like open communication. So good, bad, indifferent. Uh, let us know what you're thinking, how things are going, what you're seeing out there. And hopefully um, your loan officer will be able to add some value back to you on, on what we're seeing as well, too. So um, I didn't have quite as many uh, slides or information to share. So I will turn it back over to Lori and same deal as Cal. I will stick around. And if you've got questions, I'll be happy to try and address them. Okay, thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Cal. Um, so just a few last things. So you want to finalize your loan or financing plans. Um, so I think they both said before you sign anything or do anything, um, just make sure you've got the money to do it. Um, choose your legal form of business. Um, one of the things I just wanted to add to what Cal said when he was going through all that founder information and how they write things up, that is one of the advantages to using an attorney. I've got an example I use with my clients, so I won't do it in this section. You can call me and I'll explain it. Um, but especially with that kind of stuff, that's the thing that you will, the advantage you'll get with working with somebody like Cal is they dream up stuff you could never dream up on your own. Um, so I've got a good example of a client that she had an attorney that dreamed up stuff that, that he just foresaw something that actually happened to her. Um, you'll want to figure out that startup stuff. I've got a really great document that has all that nitty gritty stuff that um, Cal talked about with the licenses and the permits and the taxes um, that I go through with clients. I, I think of it as like the admin stuff. That's the fun websites. Um, I'm happy to go through that. Google is one of my best friends. So if there's something on there that we can't find, I will happily um, help you call, get your phone numbers, go through Google, whatever we need to do to help figure out that super fun stuff. Um, and then once that kind of stuff, you're allowed to sign leases, I would also say not only read through your lease, maybe have an attorney help you and lean on your commercial agents. Make sure they're asking all the right questions for you. I've had people come to me um, and it just seems like sometimes there, there's stuff that happens with properties that it's kind of answers are coming late in the game. So just make sure you're pushing and pushing and pushing before you sign any leases to make sure things are really clean, cleared up uh, with, with anything, whether it's contractors or commercial agents or landlords or whoever, um, so that everything is buttoned up and you're not getting yourself into anything because of questions that weren't asked before. Um, so use all your resources to, um, to do that. Um, also, we have a survey that's some quest, going to be some questions in this and an email afterwards. Please answer those. We really, like I said, our whole team is out to help people. So we want, um, if there's improvements we can make in this presentation, whether it's information I share, information Cal shares, information that Ryan shares, um, we really want to do our best to do that. They're here on a volunteer basis. We don't pay them. They get dragged into this um, by me and happily do it. Um, and I work hard to make sure this information is um, properly presented. So any feedback from you guys, whether it's the information, the format, webinar, um, et cetera, um, we really appreciate that kind of feedback. So feel free um, to get to that either now or during, um, during the uh, afterwards in the email. So we have some Q&A. Julie, how do you want to do this? Do you want me to open it up or how do we normally do the Q&A? 
<clears throat> sure, Lori. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Nicole has asked, I'm interested in forming a serious limited liability company, LLC. Could uh, Cal Rose briefly explain, please? Yeah, yeah, series LLCs, you know, we don't use those a lot. I mean, frankly, when you really dig into the requirements of a series LLC, essentially, for those of you that don't know, a series LLC is like a group of LLCs living within one company. Um, you have kind of a parent company and then each series LLC is a separate and standalone business from the other ones. Um, and you have to have separate bank accounts and um, you pay a new filing fee every time you create kind of a, a sub LLC within the series. Um, we've found whenever we've really looked at this that it's not any different than just forming three or four or five different LLCs. And it actually is a little bit more complicated when you really dig into the requirements. Um, and we do it. There's, there's reasons in, in real estate a lot of times to do it. Um, there's some other reasons from a regulatory standpoint, like a licensure standpoint, that makes it easier to get the license in one of these companies and then it would apply to the other series LLCs. Outside, outside of those like very kind of specific instances, you know, our general advice has been that it, it's actually more complicated than just having three or four separate LLCs because you still have to run all of them like different businesses. You still have to have separate bank accounts, separate financials, and, and, and keep all of those series LLCs separate and apart from one another. Um, it, there are some, again, there are some things like licensure um, that make it a little bit easier, um, but otherwise it's pretty much the same as just having four or five or more um, you know, completely separate LLCs. But if it's something that makes sense for you and your business, um, you know, there's certainly nothing wrong with it. And, and we've formed several for clients in the past. It's just, it's one of those things that sounds better than, than what it really is. Okay. Um, Sarah asks, um, our operating agreement and articles of organization were set up a few years ago and set dormant for a bit. We are unsure if as filing was made, what's the best way to find out with certainty? The IRS will not answer the question. Yeah, I mean, the best, the easiest thing to do is really look at your tax return. Most of the time, if you've made like an S-Corp election or something like that, I mean, it could be in your operating agreement. Whenever I represent companies and do documents, I put information in there about their tax status, but that's, but not everyone does, especially if you or whoever helped you set up the company, you know, just use some some sort of generic operating agreement. A lot of times that information isn't included. Um, you know, the reality is you just, you look at your, your tax returns and see how you've been filing it. I mean, that's, um, if you don't have any recollection of ever filing, um, it's form 2553 is the IRS form that you make that S election on. I mean, if you don't have any recollection of ever filing it, if your CPA or accountant didn't do it, um, you know, the only thing you can really do is, is I mean, you can submit a written request to the um, IRS and then after four or six weeks or more, they'll respond to it. Um, so, I, you know, there's, there's no good answer of figuring out, you know, whether or not you made that S election or not. Um, you know, your CPA or accountant should have those records or you should. And if you don't, then I think most likely the answer is you didn't, you know, make that election, but it's kind of hard to, to just say on this. Thanks, Cal. Um, Jamisha asked, just a little clarity on naming a business. I went to the state and federal trademark websites. Is it recommended to get the green light from these entities prior to working on websites, designs, et cetera? They're not. It would, that would be great if that was a possibility, uh, but they're not, they're not going to do that. They're not going to, you know, certify you or, or say that, yeah, this is, you know, this is available and this is good to go. Um, so there's no, I mean, even when we do it, I mean, our attorneys look at it and um, I mean, it's not like we tell you that you'll never receive a cease and desist letter, um, but 
you know, I mean, we do a pretty good job of, of being in depth about what the, the other kind of risks are of other companies currently using that. So um, it would be nice if the state or if the patent and trademark office would kind of give you that certification, but, but they're not going to, that's not something that they do. Right. I think you can, you know, the, the process of getting your name from the secretary of state, um, I probably would, you know, that one's not as, uh, that they'll either give you your articles of incorporation or they'll, they'll deny them. Um, so I definitely would get that probably done, but yeah, it's to Cal's point, they're not going to green light. You just want to make sure there's not any red lights, uh, out there. Um, Okay. And LaShawn said, maybe this is the same question, but can I operate many business entities under my LLC or do I need separate licenses? Repeat that question. Please. Can, I, can I operate many, M-I-N-I, -I, many business entities under my LLC or do I need separate licenses? No, I, I mean, that's, Kind of, kind of a complicated question to answer in a very general standpoint, but you know, there's no restriction. If, if I think I understand the question, there, there's no restriction on like, you can only have one type of business in each LLC. I mean, theoretically you could have an LLC that owns real estate that you use for your consulting services or consulting business. You know, the LLC could also, you know, own, you know, another type of business, a retail store or a restaurant. I mean, theoretically, you could do all of those different things in one LLC. There may be reasons not to do that, uh, but there's no restriction on, you know, each LLC can only have one business or one type of business. But you would need a business license for each of those individual businesses from the cities where they are located. Yeah. And I think you can get a, a an LLC can have um, one or more. Cal, you might correct me if I'm wrong, but they can apply for a DBA. And so, you, I, you know, I could have Crawford's LLC doing business as Ryan's Popsicles and Ryan's Lawn Care and doing business as, you know, Ryan's car detailing and, um, you know, get a separate license, business license for each of those. But I would not have to set up a, an LLC if I'm fine with them all rolling up um, as far as the revenues and, and ownership and stuff all to the same LLC. Okay. Um, I think it's Brandy asked, is there a specific entity we would go to to make sure our LLC articles of an organization, any, any other filings are correct? I've done them myself from reading on my own, but would love some professional help. Well, I mean, you can always, so anything that you filed to the Secretary of State's office, you can always request a copy of those um, and they'll give them to you. I think to know if, if they're correct, uh, you know, I mean, I think there's, there's probably a lot of different ways of defining incorrect in this instance. Um, you know, if they filed it and processed it and your LLC exists, you know, at a very basic level, that means um, that the articles were correct, at least in the sense that the Secretary of State processed it and formed your LLC. Um, you, you know, when we start getting into like operating agreement type of conversations and, and is your operating agreement correct or, or does it, you know, fit your business and, and your kind of ownership structure, you know, that's kind of a more in-depth kind of conversation that, that would probably require you to go to um, an attorney and have them look at it. Um, you know, nobody else is going to just look at your operating agreement and say, you know, this is either correct or incorrect. Sometimes when you open up a bank account or you go to a loan, you know, Ryan or, you know, someone that's, that's on the bank team will review your operating agreement. They may point things out that need to be updated or changed or, or should look differently, but it's not like they're doing an in-depth review from, from an entirety of the legal like, perspective and saying, you know, thumbs up or thumbs down on that. So, uh, you know, at a basic level, your your articles are correct. You know, if the if the Secretary of State processed them and formed your LLC. Outside of that, when we're talking about an operating agreement, you know, that's really something that 
think you'd have to consult an attorney to have them take a look at it and you know they need to make make sure that they understand your business and the ownership structure and kind of the short and long-term goals of, of the company but outside of that there's there's not really anybody i know of that's going to look at your documents and say yeah this all looks right or or doesn't right i think you're ahead of the game though by preparing them yourself and and doing some research that probably means that that you have read them and are familiar with the structure all the way through um i can't tell you how many times that we have received a set uh, an operating agreement from an llc um and then you know we read it and we prepare loan documents and say hey you know we need your spouse to sign and they said well well why well because that's what your operating agreement says that that needs to happen in in this or, or whatever example it may be so um to cal's point if they're going to address the things that you need them to address then then they are correct um and they they set the rules that that we abide by when we're putting loans in place um and and same thing when you know if you're dissolving a company or something like that it's going to set out the rules on on how that goes um and so the the danger in just finding something online and and putting your business name in there and signing it is there may be things in there that that you didn't um uh, uh maybe aren't set up the way you would want and maybe it addresses things that aren't necessary but leaves out something very important like a, a partner buyout or how you're going to split um, proceeds or who you know is a hundred percent agreement to make a decision or is 51 percent of the ownership constitute uh, the ability to make a decision so uh reading them and and working on them put you ahead of the game i think we may have missed a <clears throat> a question from celine on do i need yeah. to have a store location before i can form an llc No, I, no. The short answer is no. Um, it might help to know kind of exactly, you know, the type of business where it's going to be. Um, yeah, those things are are helpful. The more you know, whenever we set up the LLC, the you know, the better that we can kind of tailor this to to your specific business. But um, no, you don't have to have it ready to go. Um, you know, you you are going to have to give the Secretary of State an address for the business whenever you form it. Um, you know, most people in that situation would just use their home address. Um, and, and as long as you're comfortable with that, then, then there's nothing wrong with going ahead and starting up an LLC, you know, before the business is necessarily like open and, and you have a location picked out. Okay, another one from um, Gap Relief. Are there examples of operating agreements out there that can help me to see the variations in how others have chosen to go into agreement? I don't know how to come up with this from a blank slate, but could see it helping to have examples to bounce off of. I'm sure there are. I mean, I'm kind of Googling it right now. You know, I, I, I mean, we don't have, like at my law firm, we don't like publish a form library or anything like that. But if you Googled operating agreements, um, I'm sure there are a lot of examples out there that you can use. I mean, I, I know that there are examples out there because I've had clients come to me afterwards and say, hey, I found this online and filled in the blanks and signed it. And usually in that context, we are you know, amending it and replacing it with something else and something better. But um, there are certainly you know, samples out there. Um, I don't I can't point you to any like specific location or any you know, reputable source. But um, you know, if you Google it, I, I'm I'm confident that there will be a lot of examples that pop up. And you know, you need to just make sure that to some degree it fits what you're looking for. Just as one example, you know, like the operating agreement that I use for a company that has one owner, if it's 100% owned and there aren't business partners, you know, that operating agreement is seven to eight pages. Um, there's just not a lot of complexity in that situation. You know, you don't need pages of information about managers and, and voting rights and what percentage of the vote is required to do x y and z you know we compare that with like an operating agreement that i would draft for a business with you know two three or four business partners and that's going to be you know 25 pages um or more or less a little bit and it's just because you know that the, the facts behind that company that business and that ownership structure you know necessitate a much different form of operating agreement. So when you're 
you know, just when you're looking online and trying to find something to give you examples, um, you know, try to make sure that it contemplates at, at a high level, you know, how many owners are going to be involved in the business uh, so that you're kind of look, comparing apples to apples. Larry asks, is an LLC the same as a business license and do I need permits for a handyman service? Also, is insurance required for an LLC? LLC is not the same thing as a business license. I can answer that one confidently. Um, I mean, for a handyman, I think it depends on what you're doing as a handyman. I mean, if you're using, if you're talking about being a handyman at its most simple and basic, I, you know, I, I don't believe that there are any licenses, but as soon as you start working on plumbing, electrical, HVAC, you know, all of those things are going to require licenses, um, you know, in order to, to perform those functions. So, it, you know, the, generally speaking, just saying the word handyman, it, it's hard for me to be able to give you an exact answer without knowing like more of the specifics. Um, but, you know, you don't need a license to replace your drywall. Will, you will need a business license. The licenses that Cal's referring to those are professional licenses. So plumbers have to have licenses the same way cosmetologists, doctors, real estate agents, plumbers. So it just, but you will need a business license for handyman service. So that just to jump in. Right. And from, from a permitting standpoint to city hall at wherever you may be um, looking to do work, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure on what we're looking at from uh, the scope of things, but yeah, if you have a, um, you know, if you're doing an add-on or something, or if you're adding a, you know, a hot tub, some cities may require a permit for that, um, mm -hmm. a building permit and others, um, you know, may set anything under a certain amount or with, with, with some scope. So city hall may be a good resource to ask on some of that as well. And, uh, for Larry and for anyone else that's interested, we actually have a list of all of the, um, um, chambers of Commerce, city services for every city in Northwest Arkansas. And so I can, I can send that to you by email. Um, another question that he asked was, do you offer help to start record keeping and bookkeeping? And I'm assuming this is for the ASB TDC. We actually do have a um, finance boot camp, but we have a consultant, uh, more than one consultant that can give you some guidance in that. So again, um, I would refer you to your consultant. And just for anyone that's on here, I, I mentioned this in the chat, but if you're not a, a client of the ASB TDC and you want answers to these questions and, and any others and our help, then just simply go to our webpage at sbtdc.uart.edu and you can click the get a consultation button on any page and we will put you in touch with one of our stellar consultants who can help you with whatever you need. I don't see any other questions right now. Oh, okay. Larry, thank you for your email and I will get that information to you, the info on how to obtain a business license. Okay, any other questions for Cal or Ryan or Lori before we close. Okay, Lori, do you want to uh, um, close out the the uh, workshop then? Um, I just like to say thank you all for attending and like Julie said, reach out to the center and get with any one of us. Um, there's a lot of nitty gritty there's big picture stuff there's just you know an immense of ways we can help you and like I said I get on calls with people and just get to know you and what you're trying to do and then we figure out what the next steps are so it's free to you um I don't know that I mentioned that in the first part but our services are free so you are gonna have um there's really no 
uh, reason um, not to chat with one of us. Um, and we will do our best to help you. Like I said, we are all here because we like to help people. Um, we have that kind of intrinsic value in all of us. Um, so we will do our best um, to help you in whatever way you need. So I really encourage you um, to reach out to us and um, reach out to Cal or Ryan or an attorney or a banker for any of your questions um, related to legal issues or banking. Um, just another note on bankers, talk to them early. I will tell you that in a meeting. Um, and then um, I will put my email in the chat if you want to email me. Um, but we are so excited that you're here. And please, again, we have this survey coming out. Um, respond to that. We are here to serve you. And so we want to make sure that we do our best with these seminars and um, the way we do our consultations. So again, thank you for being here. Um, we just love these and love to help our clients.